Greetings, growers worldwide. Jordan River here, back with more Growcast, broadcasting from the Clone Dome. Today, we have Rizo Rich back on the line, my good buddy, Growcast Seed Co. Breeder, and so much more. We're going to talk about taking cuttings, taking clones, cloning gear, talk a little bit about soil and compost. It's a really good episode. I know you guys love these Rizo Rich episodes. Before we get into our show, though, quick shout out to Mighty Hydro. That's right. Mighty Hydro, our preferred partners down in San Diego, the only hydro store that we support down there because they're the only one who support us. Shout out to Mighty Hydro serving the community for a really long time in San Diego. They recently hosted us for our Pestapalooza. It was awesome. Shout out to everyone who came out to the SoCal classes. We love Mighty Hydro, and they have what you need if you're a home grower, a commercial grower. They'll answer your questions. They'll take care of you. Mighty Hydro on Complex Drive in San Diego. Again, they support education. They're willing to host our classes, get the word out to the good people, you good growers of the world. It's uh, really disheartening when I reach out to some of these locations, and they're just simply not interested in education. I've been hung up on. I've been told uh, we just have commercial growers. We're not interested in helping spread the word of growing. And then you get people like Mighty Hydro, super, super supportive. Great selection, great staff. Find them on Complex Drive in San Diego, California. Thank you, Mighty Hydro. Okay, let's get into our show with Rizo Rich. Thank you for listening and enjoy this show. Hello, podcast listeners. You are now listening to Growcast. I'm your host, Jordan River, and I want to thank you for tuning in again today. Before we get started, as always, I urge you to share the show. I mean it. It really helps us out. Hit that share button. Send this episode to a grower, to a smoker. I know they would love it. We are here every single Monday. If this is your first time tuning in, make sure to hit follow. Make sure to hit subscribe on Spotify, on iTunes, whatever you're listening to. And of course, we're live every Wednesday for members only at the Order of Cultivation. Thank you so much for tuning in, everybody. I do appreciate you listening to the show, sharing the show. It means the world as we continue our mission of overgrow. Today, we have fan favorite, my good buddy, and the head breeder of Growcast Seed Co. on the line. Rizo Rich is here. What's up, Rich? How are you doing, man? I'm doing good, man. How are you doing? Doing excellent. Just doing my thing. I know you're grinding away at Seed Co. Just did an awesome weekend promo all about peaches on regalia. Make sure you're on the green list so you get all that information. You might have missed out on that one. Rich, how's it been going over at Growcast Seed Co.? Fulfilling all these orders? This Peaches on Regalia strain that you were giving out extra freebies of was um, really making some waves, man. What a great strain. Your Rotten Rosé by Peach Quake. Uh, how are things and, and how is the PER treating you? Yeah, man, it's been super busy. So first off, you know, I just want to start by thanking everybody for the support as usual because people have been awesome and and you know just supporting us in seed co and allowing us to to further our our breeding projects and uh you know get some awesome genetics out to people so far as the the peaches and regalia yeah that one is a uh that's an amazing strain we've got a couple people that are growing it right now we've had people that grew it in the the past one member um grunt grown i believe it was was growing yes. it in howitzer yeah, Howitzer. He had uh, or Grunt Grown on IG. He had um, he got really good returns on his pheno for washing. I want to say it was something like seven percent or seven point one or two or something. It was some crazy high numbers. Dumped, and the plants were just beautiful. That was one of the most gorgeous presses I've ever seen. Worth a follow at Grunt Grown on Instagram, of course. In our membership, uh, Howitzer ran that per, and yeah, man, you really did something special with that strain. Very, very impressive on the visuals and then of course the washing numbers like you said just out of this world that guy actually has a video and i think i reposted the video of him pressing that peaches and regalia so if anybody wants to check out the rosin they can from that but um yeah dude that one's an, an amazing strain the rotten rose mom is is awesome you know it's it's uh, got that gmo in there and then of course you got the peach quake with you know uh, max stomper peach pie from bloom seed co there's a guy in Canada as well recently that's growing it for the rec market, and he has some stunning phenos. I, I can't remember how many phenos he has. I want to say it's, I know I got test results back from four of the phenos that he had. One of them had uh, pretty decent CBG numbers too, which kind of surprised me. I didn't expect that hmm. with the uh, peaches and regalia. But Love little surprises like that. 
Yeah, it was an, it was a nice little pleasant surprise, but um he actually got them tested 2 weeks before harvest and then they test again 2 weeks or and then they test again when they harvest. I don't know if that's some kind of Canadian protocol or something, but <laughs> it was super interesting to get, you know, early test results and then hopefully he'll send me these these final test results to look at just because you don't really get a chance to see that often, you know. Yeah, Usually absolutely. it's tested when it's, you know, completed done i love to see the stuff in the recreational market i mean my goodness if anybody is listening and and growing our stuff in the recreational or medical markets uh, please let us know send us the results send us some pictures don't you love to see that rich especially north of the border oh you know in other countries that's very cool yeah and that guy in canada got one of there's one pino he has it's absolutely stunning it's like blood red huge buds super frosty you know, there's just some amazing phenos in that line. Great washers, lots of terps. The Rotten Rosé mom that I use is originally bred by Relentless Genetics. So you're going to have a lot of color coming out, too. Plus, the peach plate is, of course, super colorful, too. So mm-hmm, that it's Rotten an all around, you know, killer one to grow. Yeah, killer stuff, man. You're just, you're doing so great out there. And shout out to all the members who are doing amazing jobs growing out this work. Yeah, no doubt. So many good examples. And uh, that PER, the peaches on regalia, amazing, still available. So shout out to everyone who scooped a pack. So obviously you've been working hard. You've been pheno hunting, you've been breeding. But uh, today we are going to cover a variety of kind of grow topics. People love to hear you talk about grow, to talk about soil. Like I said, you're pheno hunting. We're going to cover taking cuttings today. It was funny, Rich. I, I recently did an episode and we were talking about cloning tips, but really we only got into cloning gear. And we never really got into like tips themselves during the course of the conversation. So I wanted to revisit it with you, a guy who takes a lot of cannabis cuttings and talk about the strategies, talk about the best practices, also some gear, right? Like how to do good setups, how to do compact setups that don't take a lot of space, but also best practices, getting that success rate up to 90% plus, making sure you're not bringing in any pathogens, any pests, anything like anything like that. And just go over all the nuances. Does, this, does that sound good? Yeah, I mean, that would be awesome. You just went through this, right? Did you not just take like uh, dozens and dozens of cuttings? Yeah, actually, yesterday I was, t- I was taking a bunch of cuttings from uh, everybody in the current pheno hunt that I'm doing. So I wanted to make sure, you know, I had everybody backed up because I just flipped them to flower. Not yesterday, but the day before. So then I took clones the day after while they're still in that you know vegetative state yeah absolutely so you were taking uh lowers probably right you know one of the questions i get where i i answer the the truthful answer is there's virtually no difference between taking those tops and taking those lowers and you were taking the lower branches before flower right so yesterday i was taking a couple lowers a couple mids and i did take a couple top ones just because there were some plants that had too many tops and a couple of the tops were you know a little bit higher on the canopy than i would have liked so they were perfect for taking just to have some hardy bigger cuts rooted but uh, i personally i like to take those mid-level cuts that aren't super woody and super thick like the very top ones but they aren't necessarily really flimsy like some of the bottom ones tend to be that's true so i I try to hit that mid area a lot if i can but you know i still do use the the bottom tops as well so i I don't really discriminate when it comes to cloning it's it's really whatever catches my eye on that plant at the time that looks like it would be a good cunning and not affect uh you know my flowering like oh i'm taking a big bud away or anything like that you know yeah yeah absolutely and good point it does just kind of depend on or rather determine the rigidness of of that cutting because a lot of those lower branches that they're probably not receiving a lot of light as your plant has grown up and and created the canopy above those lower kind of sucker branches you know it's kind of like a tomato plant you get all those little sucker branches yeah they root just fine but they're going to be more flimsy they're going to be more wobbly Maybe more susceptible to things like damping off, possibly. Totally. But I never, I never discourage anyone from taking those lowers. If you do it right, you can still get ninety percent plus success rate. Absolutely, man. Good stuff. I do appreciate that. And another interesting thing that I think you showed me, Rich, is a lot of people they they kind of individualize cuttings. When in reality, any part of this plant really will clone. I've seen people hack a whole lower arm off of a plant, yes. right, with several nodes. And then take that thing, dip it in cloning gel and stick it in a wet 
half gallon pro mix jar and that thing rooted into its own plant. Yeah, it's basically a plant when it roots, you know, a full on plant. Totally. Some people, you know, uh, they just think of the cutting itself, but really it's it's more about this plant being able to regenerate and produce these adventitious roots, as they're called, these roots yeah. that come out of the side of the branches. And there's a million ways to do it, you know? Yes, that is true. A million ways to skin a cat. Uh, just really quickly, though, um, the dino tooth picture got a lot of play. Those adventitious roots that come out of the sides of, of the branches and, and things like that. I see it on tomatoes when it gets too humid. I see it on all these different plants. Oh, but, yeah. But your cultivar of tectonic truffle, I believe it might be coming from the truffle cake. I don't know. That thing spat out two inch adventitious roots <laughs> above the soil line. <laughs> I a, believe a it. dozen of them. It was crazy. They were almost reaching down into this. I almost wanted to put a little more soil on there. So they started reaching down into the soil. I'd never seen anything like it. I posted it on Instagram. I was calling it the, the dino tooth post because it looks like these big teeth almost, you know, like these uh, white roots coming out of a, a sheath that looks like a bunch of teeth. But um, that is what those are called for the listener, those adventitious roots, the same ones we want when we take a cutting. Yeah, I think you're onto something with it. Truffle cake tending to, to do that quite a bit because I do notice the truffle cake mom does like to, to throw a lot of those roots like that. Those, you know, above the soil line roots. Yeah, man. And uh, it is very cultivar dependent. I, I believe that the ability to produce those roots is obviously linked to something in the genome because you have, I'm sure you've had this, where you take multiple cultivars and you take cuttings and you put them in different trays. Some strains root much more quickly and oh, easily absolutely. than others. Have you totally noticed that, that it's cultivar dependent? Yes. Yeah. A hundred percent. I don't know what that is, but it, I've definitely observed that. Yeah, it is interesting to observe just plants in general, how some want to regenerate a lot faster than others and how others will just, you know, take their fucking time. I've had clones that will root in six days and then others that want to take, you know, 14 days. And it's like, what's going on here? Y'all are doing, you're getting the same exact shit, you know? Yep, exactly. The adventitious root, it's in a root that arises from any other point Aside from the radical, the embryonic root or the root axis of a plant. So any root that spits out of anywhere else is an adventitious root. And that's what we want. Now, people like to expose as much of the inner plant meat as possible to encourage this adventitious root growth. So, Rich, I'm sure you've heard. I'm sure that you do it. Cutting at an angle creates more of a wound than cutting perpendicular. Yeah. Do you do anything else? Do you do any shaving or anything like that or no? I do cut at an angle for more surface area, like you mentioned. It just makes sense and uh, gives more surface area for roots to form off that cut. I have tried like taking a razor blade and going around the stem and scoring lines going vertical, like mm. up and down along it. Or shaving it, like like you were mentioning, right. to kind of expose more of the inner meat and get them to root faster. I didn't really notice anything significant where I was, you know, like, I have to do this every single time I take clones now. I'm getting roots, you know, three days quicker or anything. I didn't notice anything crazy like that. So I just stick with that, that slanted original cut and just leave it at that because it's, it leaves a nice pointy end for you to stab it into the cube when you go to cube it. Yep. And, uh, you know, it's when you shave them or you score the stem like that, it tends to make it more flimsier, which makes it harder to put into the cube or media. And sometimes it bends or breaks. And then you got to take another cut or redo it, you know, redo the end piece. So I just, I just stick with that slanted cut. It works great. Easy. Yep. You know, don't have to think a whole lot about it. I totally agree. And, and my rates were kind of up there already, but I also tried the shaving method, which is very, very easy. You, you know, that lower end that's going into the ground, you just broadways slightly shave off little, little shavings and hairs come off. And you can see that you've gotten rid of that outer herd of the, of the plant stem and you're exposing right. that inner goodness. But I, I was like you, I wasn't like, whoa, the roots came so much faster or anything like that. It just seemed to also work. So it's, it's this idea of getting these roots 
to expand out of the plant tissue surface. And one of the things that aids in that is whatever agent you're using, right? Generally, it's a hormonal process to tell the plant, hey, it's time to create roots. You don't want to be focusing on anything right now except creating roots. Something has gone horribly wrong, you know, maybe in nature, something broke off this branch, right? Or, Or like chewed off a part of the branch. And now you're on the ground and you don't want to be producing fruits or leaves or anything except getting more roots going so that you can continue on as, as, as an organism. So we apply hormones kind of manually, synthetically, right? And that allows us to get a much higher success rate. One of the biggest problems that I see with people cloning is they're not using any products at all to stimulate the root growth yes. or they're using something that I'm sure helps but doesn't help like the products that are designed to help. Meaning they're using something like honey or something like uh, just plain water or something like that and and not an actual stimulation agent. So what do you, what do you use as a product for cloning gel? Man, I got a lot to say on this. All right. (laughs) And you can go back to former episodes that I'm on with you and we've talked about it in like, you know, a year or two ago in the past is what I'm talking about. And when I was taking clones and I was using my auto cloner, you know, I wouldn't use any hormones and I would just throw them in there and everything would root and I'd get great success. Uh, The only problem that I found with that is that it was taking twice as long to get things to root, which for somebody like me, who, when I was taking clones, I had a lot of time in between. It wasn't a big deal if it took an extra week to root things. It just didn't matter. So I was fine with it. These days, I do use a cloning gel just because it's a little bit faster. And it's not even really to do with the the quickness of it. I found that when you don't use something and it takes longer, that the cutting is going to feed off of the leaves that are on it. So the idea is to get those roots, get those cuttings rooted as quick as possible so that cutting stays green. Yes. So when you go to plant it, it can focus on vegging right away. And it's not focusing on, okay, well, most of my leaves are yellow because I are half yellow because I was feeding off of those leaves. Keeps the cut healthy. Week that I was sitting there. You're so right. To stay dude. Alive. You're so right. The key to healthy cuts yes. are fast cuts. That's a really good point. I don't think anyone's ever really like made that comparison on the, on air. Yeah. And, you know, I don't care necessarily about the speed unless there's a reason I need to, like I'm in a hurry or I need to get these clones in right away. But for me, it is more so the health aspect of it. The quicker they root, the healthier and better the plant's going to be all around for the cutting. I mean, it just, it, it works a lot better that way. So I do use a gel. I use um, Root Tech. They come in these little... You can buy different sizes of them, but for like three bucks or five bucks, they make these little tiny discs that are like a half ounce or one ounce of cloning gel. And I just buy those because I can literally go in and if I'm doing multiples, I'll obviously take some out and use it. But uh, if if I'm just using the same cuttings, like taking a bunch of truffle cake, I'll just go in and just dip it in that tiny little puck. And by the end of cloning, I just throw that puck away because I'm not going to use it again. You don't want to dip shit in there and save it for next time. You know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, I just find it easy because there are these tiny little things and I don't have a big bottle of gel sitting on the counter that might go bad, you know, before I use it. So I usually use those and I notice it has a pretty high percentage of the hormone in there that we need for cloning. A lot of these products, they all have it in there, but each product has its own concentration of them. And if you look at the concentration, you know, some are higher than others. And Root Tech has a, a pretty decent amount in it. So I found yes. it, it tends to work really, really well for me. So I use, I use that one. It's funny you say that. Root Tech was my favorite as well. It's a good price, right? And I just like the consistency of that nice orange gel in there. Now, you're right. There is one hormone that's been identified to help all these different plants grow. Uh, and, and, yeah. And I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure there's, there's more, but the one that you see on all of these products virtually indole three oh, yeah. butyric acid, it's an acid uh, that stimulates plant growth uh, roots specifically to get cuttings to root. You can buy pure 
indole 3 butric acid, and it'll be much cheaper that way. You get a lifetime supply, right? But a, uh, a root tech container is it actually lasts me quite a long time. You only use little, little bits of it. You don't need a massive glob on there. You just need it no. covering the surface area. So you're absolutely right. Grab your favorite cloning solution, turn it over, and you're going to see the same thing every time, indole 3-butric acid. And then take a look at the concentration because they dilute it into a gel. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and that'll tell you how strong that product is. And you'll be surprised, you know, uh, that some are going to be yeah. more expensive for less. I was looking at one from, and I'm sure most longtime growers have seen the powdered, powdered ruining hormone. You can buy it at like Lowe's or Walmart anywhere. I can't remember the name of it. Is it, it it's Root just Tone? Like, yes. Root it, it, Tone. Exactly. That's by Espoma. It, it works fantastic. But if you look at the concentration, it's like 0 0.01 or something like that. And if you look at Root Tech, it's like 0.5. So that, you know, there's a lot more going on in the root tech than that. Fuck so yeah. there, the concentration does matter. They'll all do the same thing. Even if you don't use hormones, you'll still get roots. Just for me, it's about getting them quicker to keep the cutting healthier is, is really the end goal. Keeping it healthy as, as healthy as possible the entire time. Brand new product alert at AC Infinity. You guys know we love our partners, AC Infinity. Code GROWCAST15 gets you savings at acinfinity.com. They make the best tents. They make the best fans. They make pots and lights and all sorts of great stuff. The grow kits are amazing. But did you know they just dropped a brand new product? This time it is the refillable carbon filter. It's the last filter that you'll need to buy because they allow you to refill the activative charcoal on the inside. So acinfinity.com, code GROWCAST15. Before they sell out, grab the refillable carbon filters. You know, I can't tell you how much I hate throwing out these carbon filters after time. They get used up, they get clogged, they get ineffective. Now with the AC Infinity carbon filter, you can refill that activated charcoal. Like I said, it's the last carbon filter you're gonna buy for your tent. Code GROWCAST15, it'll get you the maximum savings. They reduce the savings to about 10%, depends on the item you buy but you're going to want to buy this brand new refillable carbon filter. Can't wait to get mine. acinfinity.com for all your needs from pots and snips and ratchets to lights, inline fans, oscillators, and of course, their amazing grow tents. acinfinity.com code GROWCAST15 and enjoy the brand new refillable carbon filter. Keep it safe, everybody. Keep that smell down. Be safe out there. Thank you to AC Infinity. Now, the other really common ingredient, active ingredient that you're going to see in cloning products is kind of the natural version to that indole 3-butyric acid. Yes. And that is willow bark extract. Willow bark, yeah. Have you had experience with willow bark extract, Rich? I've used products that have it in there, but I haven't like used it by itself or anything. I'm wondering if it contains like the same hormone naturally, or if it's something else, I would like to speak I to someone think on that. So. Right. But willow bark extract is again, it's a proven root stimulator. And anytime you see a product, for instance, the FOOP clone gel, right. Has the macro micronutrients has the biology, but it also has some willow bark extract in there. It's natural. Doesn't obviously. I want to too. Oh, yes, exactly. They have aloe, which is also a really great rooting agent. In fact, that might be the best home solution. If I had to put my money on which home solution has the highest efficacy, I bet you that aloe blows honey out of the water. I think aloe is probably good because it, it's basically the consistency of a rooting gel already. You know what I mean? So it sticks well to the stem. Yes. There's just a lot going on with it. That's exactly right. And it's also packed with plant hormones. Uh, it is a True. hormone delivery powerhouse. So these are all good options, right? And in fact, when I have, like right now, for instance, what is this jar of green goo? I just grabbed some random indole 3-butric acid, right? I can't quite read the thing. I'm looking at it. I can't quite read the brand name, but it's like a green goo. But then I also have the foop gel there. And I, the reason that I want to mix those two is because I kind of do want that synthetic hormone to give me fast, robust roots. But I want to expose my plant to bacteria and fungi as early as possible. It's the same reason I put a little bit of compost in my solo cups. 
because you want to get that microbiology establishing and exchanging with that root zone early, early and often. So I wouldn't recommend that people go buy two. You know what I mean? But just keep all of these things in your head. Like, where are the rooting hormones coming from to help the roots develop? Where's the bacteria coming from? Can I get some fungi in there? These are all thoughts that you should have in your mind when you're thinking about your, your rooting agent solution. Agreed. 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 Yeah, I do mine a little different. I just, I mean, we can touch on what I'm adding to my water if you want for, uh, you know, taking care of cuttings. Oh, so you don't, okay. Um, so you don't just use plain water when you're watering these clone cubes and things like that. What do you use? No, I do not. I used to. And then I started getting a little ballsier and playing around with, with adding some nutrients, some silica, a little bit of microbes into the water. And noticed that I was not only keeping the plants happier and healthier, but they were, they seemed to be rooting a lot faster. Like I said, I, I would get six days on a lot, almost most of the plants, six to eight days, everything was rooted out. And I mean, like not, you know, one little root poking out, like fully rooted out, looking beautiful. So usually what I'll do is I'll add like a, a quarter of a dose of the mammoth silica to a gallon of water. So it's like 0.5 ml for a gallon. So whatever a quarter does, that would be like 0.1 or 0.125 or something like that. It's a very, very small amount. Ooh. And then I will, some waterings, you know, I don't add the silica every watering whenever I add water cuttings in the cubes, but I do do it. Uh, maybe every, uh, it's hard to say. I guess I really don't add a ton of water for the most part. Right. Um, I might add water two or three times Total. at most. Yeah, you know? totally. Okay. So That's usually similar. I'll, yeah, usually the first time I'll do it. The second, yeah, maybe it is about every time because it's not, it's, it's really very infrequent as it is. So, uh, you know, the second time maybe I'll do like some microbes or something. So a little bit of photo plus in there. And the first time is usually when I add a little bit of the silica. And then uh, I also add some kind of micronutrient that also has a little bit of bloom nutrient in there because Ooh. P and K are extremely important for rooting. They just promote rooting and, and root growth, which a lot of people don't necessarily realize or pay attention to. So that actually can seems to, at least in my setup, seems to help with, with rooting a lot faster. Damn, man. But I put a very, very small amount of that. I would say... You know, I'm not going to lie. A lot of shit in micro I do, I do it off of eyeballing. So a lot of these measurements are, are me guesstimating here. But um, I would say once again, probably like a quarter of a dose of some kind of micronutrient or, or a bloom nutrient. Just something with a, a little bit of NPK, a little bit of silica and a little bit of microbes. And I've noticed that that takes them a long, long way. Wow. Um, the silica thing, I actually, that idea I stole from, I can't remember the name of the guy who started this, but there was this quote unquote tech for rooting that was going around like two years ago that people were using. I can't remember the name of it, but it was called something tech with uh, taking cuts. And basically you would get these crazy gnarly fishbone roots that were like super dense and, and clustered together and you get them really really fast and the recipe for it was going around and in the recipe he was adding monosilicic acid to it and i remember a lot of growers at the time were, were doing this tech i'm sure a lot of them still are because it worked so well but i stole the silica and cloning idea from that recipe only because I saw it was working so well for others. And I was like, well, it can't hurt to put a little bit in there. And you never went back. Sure, yeah, sure enough, when I started using it, it, it did seem to help. It keeps the plants, you know, the cuttings a little bit more turgid and happier. And then same with that little bit of micronutrient, you know, it's just there to aid in, in whatever that cutting needs. Man, I think that adding minerals early is, it just goes right along with what I said, right? You're adding the microbiology there. Like, let's get this exchange going. Obviously, you have to be a little bit more careful, especially depending yeah. on what you're feeding. But I think that that's something that I've probably been dropping the ball on, which is my cuttings will get stressed as I leave them in those cubes. And uh, I only start feeding them when they get transplanted from those cubes into a solo cup. 
So I, I'm going to get my mineral delivery a little more on point. Now, what I do is I apply mineral through the leaf surface. I'm a big fan of foliaring my clones, but it sounds like you deliver your minerals more through the, the young roots, which I like. Yeah. And I mean, even before they have roots, I mean, just like if you stick a rose in a cup of water that you, you cut, it's going to suck up water. Yep. Same with the cutting. I mean, you take a cutting, you stick it in a cube, it's going to suck up the water that's in there. I mean, that's why the water is there to keep it turgid. If you put it in a dry cube, it's going to flop right over. There's nothing for it to suck up and keep water going through the, you know, right. all the pressurized pump and keep everything exactly pressurized. So far, I guess I should touch on what kind of nutrient I've experimented with a couple different nutrients that you can add for cloning and all seem to work well. One was that K humate from Brandon Rust. It's like the more PK oriented nutrient that he sells. He oh, gave yeah. Me a bottle of that. Yeah, I just um I just added some N humate to my corn. I know what you're talking about. It's like a yeah. really humic acid heavy for like you look at it and it looks like it looks like a bottle of humic acid. It's like yeah. dark. Oh yeah. So I would add a little bit of that. It's got some MPK in it. I would add a little bit of that into the water that the clones were getting or or even I would even put it when I would, you know, pre-soak the cubes. Um that seemed to work well. There's a Organics Alive powder, a couple different powders that they have. Their veg or bloom one, I found you can use a little bit of either one of those works fine. Other than that, I mean, you could probably use, if you're synthetic, you could probably use pretty much any bloom or micronutrient that you wanted to at that point. Just a little wee bit, which Just shouldn't a cause. A tiny bit though, yeah. yeah you don't yeah. want to do too much. Not even half dose, like a quarter dose, you know, just something very, just enough. Yeah, man, I like this. I like this a lot. Early mineral delivery, early micronutrient Micro delivery. Meal. Now, do you do any treatment? Like, let's say you're taking cuttings off of something that someone gave you, or I don't know, just like moving from, from one room to another. Are you treating these cubes or these cuts with anything from an IPM perspective? Yeah, I treat, even if it's my own cuttings from my own grow, every time I take cuttings, they get dipped into sulfur before they get put into the cube. Damn. So some like wettable sulfur? Actually, I use the Jadam sulfur. Oh, nice. Okay, so I'll awesome. Just fill up like a, a bucket or a big, usually what I use is not a bucket. It's usually like some kind of a pitcher, like an old tea pitcher or something like that. And I'll fill it up with some water, put some Jadam sulfur in there. And uh, when I take a cutting, I take each one, I dip it in there. I swirl it around, I take it out, and I dip it in there one more time just in case I missed any spots, air bubbles or whatever. You know, a leaf may have been flipped upside down or something. So I'll swirl it around again. I pull it out, give it a shake, and uh, cube it up in the cube. And then I do kind of just let that sulfur drip onto the cube too. That is wonderful. You know, from the plant. Now, the best thing about that sulfur is pests hate it. It will kill pests. The powder is noxious it sticks around it clings on to yeah things. i like the jadam shit a lot better and it's also it's also a fungicide yes so if you if you have like a nasty pathogen or i mean powdery mildew wouldn't even survive any any sort of fungal pathogen like that is going to hate that sulfur so as far as like a quarantine protocol i don't think there's anything more effective than a sulfur bath I tend to agree, which is exactly why I do it. I used to use the wettable, and then I came across the Jadam. A uh, member actually makes it, gave me some like a year ago. Started using it, love it. I think it works better. It's less messy, like you said. Stinks to hell, but I mean, it works fantastic. <laughs> like you said, pests hate it. It's good for PM. It's just a good preventative to use. And uh, I think it, in my opinion, works a little bit better than the wettable sulfur for clone dipping. And, and the clones do fine with it. You know, they don't burn or, or anything like that. Perfect. So they yeah. do great. Oh, I'm going to have a uh, Calyx on. Okay, Calyx, and talk more about that, uh, that wettable sulfur, um, as well as Nick. But um, let's continue with the cloning protocol, and then maybe we'll get into some soil talk before we wrap the episode. So what do you use as far as your setup? You know, you've gone over the technique, you've gone over your IPM protocol. What cubes are your favorite cubes? What are you using? How do you clone in such tight spaces? Um, I've seen your setup. You, you, you slip clone domes into anywhere you can fit them. 
and it's it's really cool. All right, for the cubes, like root riots, I really like uh, rapid rooters will work fine too. Those two, I really like that consistency of the cube. I used to not use them. I used to use rock wool or other things or auto cloners. You like the spongy consistency, these yeah. kind of peat sponges. Yeah, and about the past years is when I started using those consistently, and I've kind of been stuck on them just because they work extremely well. You know, if power goes out, I don't have to worry about an auto cloner and something keeping them wet. So I just kind of throw them in the dome. I only, like I said before, I only have to water them like maybe one to three times the entire time they're reading. So I just kind of leave them alone. You know, it's very easy. And uh, those cubes, you just stick right into the soil when they're ready to transplant. So they just make it extremely easy for me. And, and uh, you know, like you said, I can slip little domes wherever and, and pretty much clone anywhere. So far as the setup, you know, I do have room for clones, you know, bigger spaces for clones too. But they, they usually end up getting taken over by the first batch that I took. Or maybe I have something vegging. So I tend to have to get creative, like you said, and find places to slip domes here or there. What I like to do is I'll either take like a a storage tote, something maybe 17 gallons. I I don't know the exact gallon size, but a decent sized tote, something that you can strap a 18 to 24 inch, or I guess even a 12 to 24 inch like LED strip light to the lid. Right. That's what I've seen at your place. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what I'll do is I'll get the tote. Um, it, preferably, it can be, preferably it's not clear and it's a completely blacked out one so you can put it anywhere and it's not disturbing you or, you know, anybody else in your house. And what I'll do is I will put the clones in the tote and then I'll take the lid. I'll burn four little holes in the top of the lid and take two zip ties, one on each side, and I'll zip tie like an LED shop light, like a strip light. Like I said, it's usually anywhere from 12 to, to 24 inches. I try to get like 18 to 24 inches so I can get a decent amount of clones in the tote. And the light that way will go completely across the, you know, the entire tote's length. And uh, that way that, that LED strip light is strapped to the lid. And then I'll poke a couple holes throughout the tote just for ventilation. And you can basically stick that fucker anywhere you could have stuck a tote. Like it was just a tote of shit you're storing, whether it's clothes or papers or whatever. And nobody's none the wiser of what's going on in there. <laughs> you know, if, if you position your holes right or whatever, it just makes it super easy. You can fit them anywhere that way. You can do the same thing with a dome, a clone dome. If you're trying to black it out, I'll just like tape some black construction paper around like the clear part of it. Or if you aren't worried about blacking it out, keep it like it is. You can slip it anywhere. You can even go with the tote method. If you're not worried about blacking it out, get yourself a clear one. You can strap it to the lid that way. What are these LED light strips and how do I know I'm not going to get one that's too weak? Yes. Okay. So that's a really good question. So with cloning, I found you don't need any super special lighting. Really what you can do is you can go anywhere like Menards, Lowe's, Home Depot, Anywhere that'll that'll sell like a ten to twenty five dollar cheap under cabinet LED strip light, that will work just fine. Recently, I've kind of switched over to the quote unquote upgraded version of that, which is just another under cabinet LED strip light from a store like that. But they are their plant version, so usually it's like a purple, blue, red, whatever. Which you know that kind of lighting spectrum I would never use, but for cloning and seedlings, it works fucking fantastic. So I do use that blurple spectrum if I can get them. For clones, it just, it, it works great. They react well. They seem to stay healthier under it. And it's such low wattage to begin with. Like, how much it is, is it pulling? Like seven to nine to 12 watts or something like that. Like no higher than 12 watts. So... It's just a very small light. Like I said, you do not have to get the plant version of it. You can just go get any kind of under cabinet kitchen LED strip light and put it in the tote and and strap it on there. Or right on top of the dome. 
Yeah, even so, or right on top of the dome. And even some of the older non-LED, like the two T8, T5 strip lights, just the basic under cabinet one will work. And most of those don't even get that hot. So I've even used those in the dome before, but I do prefer LED because it will keep it slightly cooler. If plants grow tall enough and touch it, it's not really going to burn them, hopefully, because most of those under cabinet ones just stay cool. What's cool about the tote, too, is I found that once they root, I can actually keep them in that tote for a couple weeks sometimes, depending on, you know, how I'm feeding them, what I'm doing, or, or, you know, what size container they're in. If I keep them in small containers and just kind of keep them stagnant but healthy, you can keep them in that container for a while if you get a tall enough tote. Yes, so, that's a good point. You know, it, it, it just works it comes in handy because I have a lot of people that I help that are like, Oh, I don't have room for clones or, you know, I don't have space. And I'm like, man, I'm sure in your room, you have somewhere you can put a little 20 by 15 inch tote or yep. whatever, you know, a two foot fucking long tote. It's just like a box. sitting. Somewhere. I think there's 17 gallons. Those like smaller black and yellow ones from home Depot. Yes. Fit right exactly. on top of your tent. I bet. I bet. Yeah. You. I mean, I don't, I don't want to encourage anyone to stick shit on top of their tent just in case it collapses. But I'd stick the shit right on my dog's crate. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Like, and I don't recommend people doing that because, you know, I wouldn't let your pets necessarily be that close to stuff. The one dog I stick it on is pretty much an all inside dog. It does go outside. on <laughs> <laughs> But she's old and, and hates being outside. So she just likes to lay in the house and, and even with her crate open, she just wants to lay in her crate the entire time. Oh, so I just funny, throw a, a dome on top of there, or I throw a tote on top of there. Or sometimes I throw a, to- a tote with a dome on top of it. Double. <laughs> nice, you know? dude. Yeah, you got you to gotta pack it in where you can. That square footage is, is important. It is. And you don't need a lot of room for clones. And nope. you don't need special lighting. And you don't need a special setup. You don't have to have a separate tent. You don't have to have, you know, something super elaborate for clones. It can be just a shitty fucking light bulb you have laying around your house <laughs> if you if you want, you know, in a fucking little 10-inch fucking square area if you can find one if you really want to do it, you know? I think that we, like, categorize lights into, like, you know, okay, there's, like, the flowering light and then there's stuff that's less powerful. But there's this whole huge range down there, right? Like, you can, you can grow a cannabis plant under a fluorescent. We, we concern ourselves with these high PPFDs in, fla- in flower, right? Because we want to get like perfect buds. Yeah, and even in veg, but you know, exactly with rooting cuttings and shit, you do not need that. You do not, you don't even need, you don't even need a T5. That's like, that's like huge overkill for a plant that's it just is. trying to spit out a root. Dude, my uncle used to clone with a light bulb, like a shop light, and it, and it would be sitting in a closet in the bathroom, and the shop light would just be in the top of the closet. It was just <laughs> one fucking light bulb, dude. And you'd have like 20 cuts under there, and they'd look <laughs> great. So, I mean, you can do it with fucking literally anything. Yeah. There is going to be some lighting for clone that clones that might be slightly better than others, but at the end of the day, you're just trying to get roots. You're not growing a clone in the clone space you know, full term. Mm -hmm. So you're just trying to get it rooted and get it out of there. You don't need anything special. Don't have to spend a whole lot. I think that's a great overview, man. Getting your setup cheap and uh, quickly and integrated into your space easily, right? Doing all the best practices to get those success numbers up, uh, using rooting hormones, adding biology, maybe adding a little bit of minerals on there, opening your, your vents slowly over time. Yes. Temperature is a big thing, but I think some people like it too warm. People throw in heat mats and yes. they tend to overdo the warmth, which can actually be counterproductive, I feel. I believe so too. I mean, there's always situations where you might need something like that, a heat pad, of course, but I think overall that, you, you know, you probably don't. I think I usually leave mine around with that LED, it's usually anywhere from like 78 to 83 in the tote. Right. So it's not super hot, but they do great like that. You don't want to overheat them. You don't want to keep it too cold or they're never going to throw roots. Right. But you definitely don't want to overheat them either. Very true. And I think people get caught up on the days, right? First of all, it is cultivar dependent. Some strains are just going to root differently than others. But oh, if you're yeah. getting roots in the first seven to 10 days, you're fine. Five days, you're, you're doing great. If the cutting looks healthy, just let it roll if you really want it. You know, if it's not rooted yet, but it still looks good, let it keep riding. 
Yeah. Is that about the time frame that you, you achieve in these setups a week, give or take? Yeah, usually for me, it's, you know, the quickest ones will be like six days. It's, it's usually around six to eight is what I'm hitting now with the regimen I'm using. Eight's usually the average, you right. know, around eight days. I'm getting beautiful roots. Right. And uh, you want to get that success rate up. If you follow all these steps and your water isn't, uh, you know, contaminated like my water was at my last grow, you should be able to achieve easily. 90 to 98 percent success yeah 90 to 100 for sure man yeah. i agree sometimes i mean most of the time i'm all of them live you know but if you do lose some it'll be one or two or whatever right so if you're not happy with your success rates and they're lower than that you can make improvements to to get up to that to that number and just be patient you know sometimes it'll take two weeks but you'll have those roots and you'll have those genetics for another run really good overview man yeah and you know one more thing is moisture level is a huge deal you know, we kind of touched on it, but so far as like the cubes I use, I've talked about it before. You want them moist. You don't want them overly moist. If they're too moist, the thing's never going to root because it's just going to continue to suck up water like a rosewood sitting in a dish. Um, at least that's what I found. They, If they do root, it's going to take forever or they just won't at all. I like to, to get the cube really wet and then I'll wring it out and then like yeah. shake it. And as long as the cube's not leaking water or I can squeeze it and there's not like a jet stream of water coming out of it, it's probably perfectly moist, you know? That is a really good, a really good guide. I would just like to really quickly go over these different mediums and, and yeah. how I determine if they're wet. So what you said is really good with the root riots and the rapid rooters. Like you said, they're like sponges. So you yeah. can water them thoroughly and then squeeze them until there's no more dripping water, right? There's no, it's not holding any more water, but it's fully moistened is that a good way to put it yeah it's very hard to describe it in words but yes like basically if i squeeze the cube and i see water start to like pull up by my fingers but nothing's dripping out of the cube that's when it's perfect for me nice so a little bit you, you don't wring it dry but you squeeze no, it to I the excess to dry i just don't want it you know, a stream of water coming out if i squeeze the cube that's perfect and those ones are like the sponge types right there's oh. another type of material that I would say is like the Rockwell cubes, the Oasis yeah. cubes. They're more like styrofoam. And I feel like they are, in a lot of ways, they're good for that reason. I like the Oasis cubes. They kind of like fall apart in your medium when, when you're done. They're just these like nice biodegradable styrofoam looking things. And yeah, I've never used those. they'll just spit the water out the bottom. So like if you okay. overwater them, you just empty the tray and then like wait a few minutes and then your Oasis wow. cubes are going to be perfect, right? So that's why I like those. I think Rockwell might be similar. And then the final thing I'll say is the mammoth cubes. This is, these are literally like they just took ProMix and like compressed it into these squishy. Yeah, I have not tried those yet. They're much deeper and they're literally ProMix. You can see the perlite, all the peat right. compressed down into it. So what happens there is, it, again, it's very similar since it's, so much bigger it's like probably two or three times the size of a volume of a root riot it's way harder to like waterlog that thing and you're not going to need to add water really you put your cuts in there maybe add water once and then uh you'll be ready to pull them out. now downside of those is you pull them out and they fall the fuck apart like they completely fall apart when you pull them out right that's my overview of of the different types of mediums and they're all good but no matter which one you're using you want to get that moisture level just right not too waterlogged and definitely not too dry yeah, and if you can't get cubes, you can always, some people will use like an, a really good aerated soil. But what I used to do, and I read a cultivation book from like the fucking 70s or something when I first started growing. And I've talked about it before is I do a 50-50 mix of uh, perlite and vermiculite in a solo cup. And that's perfect for cloning media. Nice. Yeah. If you can't get a hold of anything else, because you can get those at any hardware store, you know. Or if you just need like one. That was another thing that bothered yeah. me is getting a whole tray for one cutting. Oh Do it in a God. solo cup. Take that plastic bag, turn it upside down and put it around the top. There's your humidity dome. There you go. I love it, man. That's good shit. This actually leads nicely. Just really quick before we wrap the show, we can cover a little bit. Those clones of yours, I know that they go right into some form of rich soil enriched with like a compost. Can we talk compost for just a second before we hop off here? Yeah. Because this has been on my mind. I. I personally have loved introducing 
compost into my Synganic setup. I added some BioVast to my ProMix and I grew some cultivars that you know I'm familiar with, Rich. BioVast is the shit. The truffle cake and the peach dosi. I know how these come out. Right. And, and it's always a little bit different depending on the time of year and what I was doing during the grow. I get there's a lot of facets, but one of the few things that I completely changed with my regimen is I threw in a bunch of BioVast compost. And I was really happy with how those that run came out. I feel like the plants were happier throughout that extra microbiology may have done something to the way that the plant expressed. I know you loved the way my truffle came out. That was a big compliment to me. And I love this stuff. So, so I always encourage people to make their own compost, but a lot of people just don't, a lot of people can't, they don't have the space. They don't have the time. They just don't want to, which composts on the market. Have you tried recently? Which are you impressed by? And what do you think about buying bagged compost for your cannabis garden? So, yeah, you mentioned the SD microbes, Burma compost. That's probably my favorite. It's a little pricey, but it is probably you know, the top, top quality when it comes to compost. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that, dude. Yeah, that BioVast, they do have a code Growcast. I mean, it's expensive stuff. They, they make the stuff craft blend. It's not your, I don't want to say any other names. It's not your big brand compost that they're just churning out bag after bag. They, they test the stuff. I'm glad to hear you say that you like the BioVast. That makes me happy. Yeah, I use it. They sent me a big bag of it. So I use it. I just put a handful in with each plant, you know? When I go into bloom, I might put like two handfuls, but usually the plants just get a little handful of it and it's good to go. And it it's awesome shit. It, you know, it brings fungal and microbial diversity to your soil and you don't need much of it. It might be a little pricey, but you don't need much. You know, it goes a long way. Uh, you can make an extract out of it and water that in. But that's probably my favorite. Organics Alive makes a good compost as well. Ooh, what's that one like? It's basically like any other compost that you see. There's nothing like, I I can't really pick out anything. There's nothing like novel like that going on with the Organics Live. It just seems to work pretty well. They give it out in their, their sample packs, but I believe you can buy it as well. And then also another one I was using for a long time there because it was readily available and a really good price was the coast to Maine lobster compost. Oh yeah. Good call. That shit's really good. And it not only does it bring some compost into the soil, but it also brings some ocean life. Yeah. Aquatic microbes, dude, you won't get any of those lobster microbes in the manure stuff. And I would still use it right now. If, I didn't have the Burma compost and I could find it. I just, nobody's had it around here for a while that I've seen. So I just haven't been able to get it. And SD Microbes was kind enough to send me this big bag. So I've been using this, but, but either one of those or the Organics Alive, those are probably like my top three favorites of, you know, good quality compost with obviously SD probably going to be your highest. Dude, that's good call though. And the coast of Maine. Uh, the lobster compost. Yeah, and you can get that like anywhere in the country. They can ship it to you. So that's why I want to mention that one because if you're listening, you can get it on fucking Amazon, I'm sure, or order it straight from coast to Maine. They can ship it to you. I got it shipped to my dad before who lives on an island. So, you know, it's it's readily available and it's a good price for what it is. You know, for my outdoor garden, I was grabbing some bags of the Purple Cow activated compost. I do like their Indiconja blend. It's a, it's they a good, have a compost? They have a compost. It's activated compost. Oh, and it, it, they make a lot of it and they sell it for cheap. I didn't know they had one. That's wild. I'll have to look into that. The Purple Cow activated compost. I love their soil. Yep. I just didn't know they had a compost. And that stuff is a little bit more accessible if you're in the Midwest and stuff. So, yeah, really good overview, man. I'll have to try the Organics Alive compost because that's the only one that I haven't uh, tried out of those. But uh, yeah, it's got a nice consistency to it. Yeah, just increase that biological diversity, right? If you can get more species of bacteria, more species of nematodes in your soil and, and all the different fungi, that's, that's just the more the merrier. Wh- who knows which one is going to be perfect for your setup and is going to interface with your plant beautifully. Yeah, you're going to unlock more things in your soil for the plant. I think you're going to get better expressions. And and like you said, when you start adding compost, you're just going to pull out more flavors. I certainly seem to observe something like that, whether it was just, you know, better nutrient exchange because of the biological diversity or because of the immunostimulation, right? I I don't know what it was, but I feel like 
just observed unscientifically, I feel like that, uh, that extra compost really did help that run. So I'm doing it every time now. Damn, this hour flew by. Rich, anything else before we wrap it up? This was a killer episode, man. Oh, man. There's always stuff to talk about, but I think you hit on so many good things. No, man, you nailed it. Just anything else with Seedco you want to talk about? Any upcoming anything? The Apes in Space did drop. We released an AMA audio so people know about the the next pollination. Yeah, we got the Apes in Space pollination coming up. Yeah. I got a ton of phenos of Apes in Space, by the way. I think I got five or six females. And the male that I kept, of course, and that is a... Exotic genetics cross of falcon nine and grease monkeys. So I expect some gassy, funky, diesely, cushy type flavors to be coming out with those, which, you know, I, I love gas. So mm-hmm. I really want to see some more gas stuff and do some more gas projects. And the male that I have has a very, very gassy smell. So I'm hoping that that will correlate to the progeny. Yeah, the seeds, buddy. You know? Yeah, you do. You keep killing it, man. Now I'm I'm already pushing Rich for the next project. I think that we're on the same page, and I'm so excited about it. I'm not going to tease it. I'm not going to blow it now, but uh, you members will will hear more about that and already have. So, uh, Rich, just keep killing it, and we are here to support you, man. You're putting out some amazing work, and you continue to serve this community very, very well. We appreciate you, man, as as a soldier in uh, in the battle for Overgrow. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate. Everybody, like I said, and all the support. And this project will have some new females too. So everybody will see some, all sorts of new stuff coming. You know, every project I try to make better than the last. So, well, you've been killing it, man. And we'll do another episode here soon. Uh, we'll go over some more strains. I know you listeners love the strain reviews. I've got, uh, I've got some incredible ones, man. Some peach cakes that blew me away. Maybe one of the top smokes of the year. Really? Shout, yeah. Shout out to Nicola. You guys have uh, heard of member. Uh, yeah. Nicola puts out some really good flour and his peach God, cakes. One of the top smokes of the year. We're going to do some strain reviews. So don't touch that dial, everybody. That is all for now. Make sure to check out Growcast Seed Co. Of course, growcastpodcast.com. Click Seed Co. Go on through, check out all the offerings. We really, really appreciate you guys out there. Of course, members getting $20 off per pack. Thank you to you listeners. Thank you to you members. Stay tuned. We got some really cool stuff, some video content coming, maybe some streaming. Like I said, don't touch that dial. This is Jordan River and Rizo Rich saying be safe out there, everybody, and grow smarter. Later on. That's our show. Thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate you listeners so much. And thank you to Rizo Rich. Of course, if you want to come check out membership, growcastpodcast.com slash membership. Come and check out the Order of Cultivation. I'm in there every single day, hanging out in the Discord, jumping in the voice chat, smoking with the Gromies. You get hundreds of hours of Growcast TV, the video show live from the Biodome, and of course, personal access to Team Growcast 24-7, plus a whole bunch of other good stuff, including member discounts. So I'd love to see you over there. Growcastpodcast.com slash membership. Try it for seven days for free. Check out the content. I appreciate you guys supporting me so much. And I will continue to work every single day on the mission of overgrow. Because if we all grew, then everybody would have enough food and medicine to go around. Thank you so much, though. I appreciate you just tuning into this show. I hope you learned something today. And I look forward to teaching you more cultivation science and techniques in the future. Stay tuned. Don't touch that dial. Bye-bye, everybody. Do you like Growcast Podcast? Of course you do. Well, if you love this show, you're going to love A Slice of Cannabis, a show all about food and cannabis, hosted by our good friends and members, Port and the Rugged Gent. What's up, Rugged? Hey, everyone. Rugged Gent here. If you're all about cooking, great cuisine, and cannabis like I am, then you've got to come subscribe to A Slice of Cannabis. We're free to listen to on Spotify or any podcast app. So come and subscribe today. Tune in to hear from world-renowned members of the cannabis industry as we explore the beautiful relationship between the food we enjoy and the cannabis we love to consume. Season two has just kicked off, so come check it out and catch up on old episodes with Jordan, friends of Growcast, professional chefs, and much more. A Slice of Cannabis. Find us on Spotify or your favorite podcast app, and I'll see you there. A Slice of Cannabis, everyone. Go and subscribe now.
and nobody's none the wiser of what's going on in there. <laughs> you know, 